Hello everyone. Thank you for joining our session on EMI Shielding Solutions. My name is Mohamed Al Alami. I'm the Senior Field Applications Engineer for Work Electronics UK. I've been with the company now for coming up to six years. Prior to that, I worked in the aerospace industry, predominantly doing power supply design and development, as well as EMC testing. I thought to say hello and hi in person before we start our webinar session today. So the plan for today is just to give initially um, a general introduction into the topic, electromagnetic shielding. Then we will look at some basics, basic equations, relationships. So we have got a, a broad understanding of the basic terms. And then we look at shielding apertures as part and parcel of that and how they impact the attenuation of our shield. And we'll finish off uh, with the, the main section, with the main aim of this presentation, which is looking at solutions and how we can implement these solutions where they can be effective. And in doing so, we are also presenting this in the form of practical demos. So you will see various videos on effective shielding for housing, for board level, um, and we will also look at application-based type shielding as well as the thermal aspect of things. So we will cover quite a wide uh, range of different uh, shielding options to help you uh, with the design in future. Okay, so what does electromagnetic shielding mean? It means we need to introduce some form of a shielding material, some form of a protection barrier uh, between our unit and the external environment. And this barrier, this shield, serves two main purposes, to protect our equipment from external RF noise coming in, as sometimes what we refer to as immunity or susceptibility, and also to protect the external uh, RF uh, sense uh, signals from uh, any emissions coming from our unit. Uh, another part of also thinking about shielding is internal shielding within our own unit, within our own enclosure, because we do have sensitive, for example, RF circuits that we do not want to be interfered with or radiated uh, or have noise radiated on it from adjacent circuitry within our enclosure. And in which case we will need to shield those sensitive circuit circuits within our unit. Those of you who have gone through the painful investigation or EMI investigation and the hunt for the frequencies, I'm sure would appreciate how difficult it is to identify where the noise sources are. And the reason for that is everything around an electronics product is conductive and conductive structures uh, act as perfect antennas radiating and receiving EMI noise. So looking at things like the cabling, connecting your unit to the outside world, or any form of standard uh, interfaces, any openings or apertures in your enclosure, all of these leak and act as perfect antennas to allow noise or RF to leak in or leak out. Things like traces, ground planes, wires and slits on your PCB, another source of potential noise, and of course any metallic structures that you include in terms of heat sinking throughout the board would also act as a perfect um, antennas for radiating noise at various different frequencies. So things also like transformers, magnetics, some components as well are responsible for this. Yeah, integrated circuits naturally as well. All of these are your potential noise sources. And what we plan to do today is just give some form of an indication on how can I zoom in onto where my noise is coming from because ultimately we want to look for a practical solution to this. We're not going to do calculations. We're not going to go down to the umpteenth level to calculate transmission line impedances and uh, wave impedances. No, we're going to just try to do this with a finger or, or finger in the air type solution uh, to try to identify closely which uh, part of our unit is causing our noise. And this goes a long way to trying to help us with this wavelength. So the calculation for wavelength 
which is proportional to uh, frequency uh, through the equation lambda equals speed of light divided by frequency gives us an idea of the wavelengths associated with various different frequencies and those wavelengths you, as you will see on the following slides um, um, reflect the size of the dimensions of a potential antenna be it a slot, a loop, uh, or a track on a PCB or a cable harness external to your unit. This is where you can uh, sort of zoom in or home in on to where your noise might be coming from. Is it a PCB level or is it coming from external, from bigger and longer harnesses? Let's now turn our attention to the most basic types of antennas. So we start off with the electric dipole. Electric dipole, fairly basic, two conductors with uh, able to pick up or radiate, um, particularly at uh, lambda over two at a half wavelength in terms of its actual physical size of the antenna. And with the electric dipole, it predominantly radiates or picks up electric field. Doesn't mean that there's no magnetic field, there's always magnetic field, but it is predominantly an electric field with this type of antenna. Let's now link across some of what we've mentioned a couple of slides ago about wavelength and the actual dimensions of the antenna. Um, it's uh, very important uh, for that antenna to be at around a half wavelength for it to be an optimal antenna, picking up and uh, radiating noise uh, at that particular frequency wavelength. Uh, so this is where it was quite useful to have that equation that we have given you a couple of slides ago to try to help you figure out half the wavelength and accordingly the frequency at which a particular cable may be radiating at uh, or picking up noise at uh, and accordingly help you zoom in on the noise source uh, of where the noise is being uh, an issue, PCB or cable harnessing. Um, so a significant uh, effect would be observed around the half wavelength. Uh, anything that is going up to 120th is still there. Anything beyond that uh, will not be much of an impact in terms of an antenna. So if your size of your tracks or your harness is about 120th or smaller, 110th, 150th, 130th, then that's not going to be your source of your noise. That's not what's causing a problem. We've identified the electric dipole. So that's radiating, like we said before, predominantly electric field. Now, naturally, we don't just have electric field. We could have also magnetic field. It's an electromagnetic wave. So either part of it could be the dominant aspect of what's causing noise. So when it comes to a current loop, that's a magnetic dipole, it's the same thing. And that's with regards to radiating predominantly magnetic field. So things like transformers or tracks within the PCB, where, for example, you may have a very large loop when tracking your input coming back through your ground. Um, that's a very um, effective antenna in terms of radiating or picking up noise, and that can cause you a lot of problems. Um, I mentioned at the beginning the importance of layout and tracking uh, and making sure that tracks that are carrying high switching frequencies, uh, be it power or data side, uh, where the loops are kept to a minimum. This is a very basic uh, set of requirements or guidelines when it comes to layout and tracking. So uh, the radius uh, is small compared to the wavelength. That's what makes this loop uh, quite effective in terms of radiating noise. Let's now look at a few equations just to characterize a parameter called characteristic wave impedance. And this is basically the impedance of that electromagnetic wave at a distance r from the noise source or from the antenna. So ZW is equal to the electric field divided by the magnetic field. Now what we will find is that that impedance varies or changes in the near field to the far field. You hear a lot about these terms. Now dependent if it's an electric or a magnetic predominant field, we mentioned before an electric dipole predominantly generates an electric field, a magnetic dipole, a loop predominantly generates 
a magnetic field. So in the near field, in close proximity, let's say, to that noise source, to that loop, or to that dipole, the relationship is different, the impedance is different. The impedance of an electric dipole is high in the near field. The, the impedance of a magnetic dipole is relatively low in the near field. When it comes to what we call the far field, the far field is defined in the, is, is, is at a distance where that magnetic wave or electromagnetic wave impedance is constant as 377 ohms. And that's where you will see on the following slide, it makes it a bit easier and clearer to show you that variation of that wave impedance based on the distance away from that noise source. And here we go, a picture speaks a thousand words. Uh, I'll use my laser pointer. You will see the green line here shows you the electric dipole which is predominantly generating an electric field, and that uh, the electric dipole has got high impedance. This is a W on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, we have got lambda normalized, uh, or the distance normalized to lambda over 2 pi. Um, and so that's what you will see over here. Uh, very high impedance, relatively high impedance for the electric field, low impedance for the magnetic field, up until you get to this point of the transition distance, where you'll get in the far field that 377 ohms magic number, which is associated with uh, uh, mu, do, mu naught and epsilon naught, the constants for permittivity and permeability uh, of free space. And um, one thing to watch out or to note with regards to this, why is this important to identify high and low impedance? Because this will impact the type of solution that we introduce in order to attenuate that field. Now, if you have got a perfect antenna, we don't want perfect antennas here. We don't want EMI. So this is not an RF circuit where we're transmitting or receiving a signal, Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. No, this is a pain in the backside. This is a radiated noise. This is failing me my EMI. So we need to get rid of this. So we need to mismatch this antenna. We need to push this antenna out of its comfort zone. And that's what we are trying to achieve with the shielding solutions that we will be talking about in a little bit. Trying to introduce uh, something that will mismatch, that will make this antenna no longer an effective antenna. So an electric field, how are we gonna mismatch that impedance? Let's have a look. What did we say for electric field? We said it's high impedance. And what we're saying here is it's relatively easy to shield that. We'll show you how you can do that in a little bit. So from an electric field lines, let's say we have got two conductors there, as you can see, and there's an electric field going through, depositing uh, charges on either side, and that's creating that uh, electric potential difference between those two electric field, between those two points. How do we get rid of this electric field? All we need to do is just balance those charges. Perfect. So I want to make sure that those two conducting plates have got a short circuit between them. Can I do that? Maybe I can. If it's two faces of a unit of, a, of, a, of my enclosure, I just want to make sure that those two are tied in together and there is no distance between them. We'll see this on a, f in a coming few slides. No apertures, no openings. But if it is two tracks on a PCB on successive layers, I can't do much about that. I can't connect two signals that are not related to one another. So in some occasions, what I might be able to do is put a capacitor in between those two points. So minimize the ability for noise to or for, for charges to collect, create a bypass for that noise to go through. Um, so solutions, of course, sometimes are PCB based solutions, but we're not talking about components today. We're talking about shielding. So um, it's the same concept. I'm just trying to show you various different alternative ways of thinking about this. Um, From a magnetic field point of view, it's a bit more difficult to try to shield magnetic fields, uh, particularly when they are at low frequencies. I mean, when we're talking about low frequencies, we're talking very low frequencies here. So we have got various different types of solutions. There's fairly high permeability materials for the very low frequency fields. We will show you some of these on the following slide. For medium frequency fields, we can use skin effect, so metallic type materials, which can absorb that magnetic field. 
or attenuated. And for high frequency fields, we can use either reflection or absorption. These are the various different methods that allow us to try to attenuate, to shield from magnetic fields. So um, this is the, the various different types of materials available. New metal, for example, very high relative permeability. That's usually used for static or low, very low frequency fields in the Hertz. So shielding effect is a lot more effective when it comes to other types of materials. The higher the permeability is, and the thicker the shield is, and the smaller the shielding volume is. So if we are able to identify that noise source, if we are able to use thicker material, then we will get more for our money from a shielding point of view. This is a graph of the theoretical calculation of shielding, absorption and reflection for copper and aluminium. Just to give people a reference point, uh, as we can see, the, the reflection and absorption are different based on the frequency, uh, as we can see it on the x-axis, and attenuation is shown on the y-axis. Okay, let's turn our attention now to shielding apertures. And uh, in this section, we we'll just want to mention that with regards to the measurements of shielding attenuation, this is limited by the 120 dBs marker uh, because of noise floor. And actually, there's no point in measuring something below that uh, from a shielding effectiveness. Shields are usually 5, 10, 20 dBs effective. Um, another important point to mention is that there is no perfect field. Our enclosure is bound to have connectors, openings uh, to allow signals to come in and out on cables um, or Wi-Fi. Um, in addition to, of course, uh, ventilation uh, for heating point of view um, and heat sinking. So we're bound to have apertures, openings and slots in order to facilitate uh, for all of the above. Uh, in doing so, the existence of these apertures uh, impacts quite substantially uh, the ability of the shield to provide attenuation so it limits the effectiveness basically of our enclosure as a faraday cage and uh, accordingly as well the higher the frequency is uh, that is being uh, radiated or um, 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 emitted from external to the unit uh, the um, less effective uh, the shield is, the more likely it is for those frequencies to leak through in or out of our unit. Um, um, so what is that relationship? How does that work? So with regards to the dimensions of the slit we, or the actual aperture, we look for the maximum linear dimension. So with a square, it's going to be its rectangle, its uh, diagonal, beg your pardon, with a slot, the, 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 the slot length or the slit length. Um, and the relationship between these lengths and the wavelength that we've mentioned before at the beginning of today's presentation is that uh, as this approaches, as this length approaches uh, the lambda over 2, the wavelength divided by 2, the equivalent frequency to that would have minimum or would have reduced attenuation. So you can work up to that frequency with effective shielding. Anything above that frequency, you will not have an effective shield in the form of uh, because of the existence of this dimension uh, this dimension aperture so just to remind you again from a dipole antenna's point of view the the maximum dimension that we've mentioned on the previous slide would be lambda over 2 that would make a perfect dipole antenna and that would mean that at that given that frequency that um, shield is no longer effective. That aperture is allowing that frequency and anything above it to go through. Um, when it comes to also another aspect of it, uh, ventilation side of things. So sometimes we need to have bigger openings and bigger apertures, which means lower and lower frequencies where the shield is no longer effective. Uh, how can we uh, resolve that issue? Uh, instead of using one single large opening or aperture we can make it into multiple smaller ones and in this case the actual maximum dimension is smaller but 
having said that unfortunately we also need to take the overall diagonals dimension let me just show this with a laser pointer to make it easier so naturally here is a lot longer uh, um, uh, a length um, a dimension in here the dimension now is a lot smaller so we can be more effective up to higher frequencies as a shield but unfortunately we can't just take this dimension into account we also need to take this dimension as well into account so this impacts the overall effectiveness of the shield as it stands and on here we can show you how you can calculate the impact on shielding effectiveness it's attenuation basically based on the number of these tiny little holes or apertures um, that you are creating within your shield so n would be the largest number of openings or apertures in any dimension so in this dimension this dimension or diagonally um, and l is the diameter of each one of these circular holes um, and this is one key aspect or this equation does help you facilitate for you to show you the drop in frequency uh, and attenuation based on the wavelength So to give some perspective on the previous slide and the equation that was provided we've included these two hopefully quite useful tables just to give you an idea uh, and in here we're looking in the left hand side uh, the table is showing us the um, uh, maximum slit length that you're going to have to achieve a minimum of 20 dBs attenuation versus frequency. So if your frequency of noise is at 30 megahertz, the so maximum length of slit that you can have is 50 centimeters. You can't go in order to achieve 20 dBs of attenuation. Uh, naturally you can go higher if you're uh, happy to achieve less attenuation out of your shield and as you can see as you go and up in frequency naturally that length becomes smaller and smaller and that would be the maximum slit size that you can have at 5 gigahertz for example at the very bottom there on the right hand side it shows you uh, based on a number of uh, holes or apertures that we have uh, as per what was shown on the earlier slide uh, how much attenuation drops as a result of the introduction of the extra hole so if you have two holes instead of one it's a drop of 3 dBs in the attenuation of the shield if you have 100 holes it's a drop of 20 dBs of the attenuation of that shield just a quick hello and hi just to make sure you haven't gone to sleep I'm still here I'm not a robot so I am in the background waiting for your questions later on Okay, the final section of today's webinar is on shielding solutions. We're going to give you a general overview of the various different options that you have. Uh, this picture is really uh, quite nice because it does give you the various different options we have mentioned at the beginning of today in terms of housing solutions or cable solutions or PCB uh, options as well. So it gives you that um, a visibility. We're going to cover all of these different types of solutions, but we're not just going to talk about product. We're also going to show you how that product's working so there will be demonstration uh, videos as we're going through uh, to give you a better perspective on how these component actually how these components actually work so we'll start off with um, housing solutions or casing solutions uh, anything to ensure that you have got continuity in your enclosure uh, be it around the lid or the cover uh, of the enclosure and the main enclosure body or uh, near uh, or around where you might have um, uh, some connectors coming in uh, we've got the D sub 9 here as an example so you can have stamped gaskets that can fill up any of these openings or apertures to ensure that you have got um, a minimum uh, opening or uh, no openings whatsoever um, as a result uh, and with this type of gasket it's a conductive gasket you can use a spring gasket you are maintaining that continuity that conductivity between two faces uh, the fabric type gasket is a very flexible type material it's foam in base as you can see um, in the picture so the base here is a foam material surrounded by a nickel copper conductive outer fabric uh, the shield, uh, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, the gasket does have an adhesive tape which can be conductive, but that's not necessarily an absolute requirement. As you're putting compression on this shield, on this gasket, 
you are making contact with the surface on all uh, sides of the actual uh, gasket material. It is IP54 rated and it's got various different um, shapes and sizes. It comes in various different, um, uh, what's the word? Um, profiles is the word. And as you can see here, to adhere to the different shapes uh, within your unit, uh, different uh, mechanical requirements of your unit to ensure that you have got that continuity, that you are plugging any gaps or openings or apertures within. One thing to be uh, aware of uh, when you're selecting your shielding gasket is uh, the base material of your enclosure. I mentioned uh, earlier that the um, gasket is made out of a fabric with nickel copper as the conductive material. We also do that same gasket with aluminium as the conductive material and the reason being is galvanic corrosion. Uh, as you can see from the table here, aluminium works much better with an aluminium based enclosure as opposed to nickel copper from a galvanic corrosion point of view as the picture shows. Okay, so that's, uh, that's that. Um, on the following slide, we will show you a video uh, that was uh, conducted by one of my colleagues, Laurent Focal, and he is doing an experiment to show you the effectiveness of gasket shielding. Hello, my dear friends of electronics. Today in this video, I want to show you the effectivity of shielding gasket. What we have here, we have here a small box. It's an EMC box from Virtual Electronic in collaboration with the University of Valencia, with the Cathedra EMC. And um, it's inside a small signal generator which is generating a quite noisy signal, uh, closed in, on a 50 ohm resistor. And then we have here a spectrum analyzer and scanning from uh, 100 kilohertz up to 400 megahertz the near field scanner uh, probe for magnetic field. So I will switch on the trace and put to maximum hold and I will go on the corner and then you can see this on the corner is a metal box, aluminium metal box completely closed and strongly closed with the screws. But still, if you go here, you can see, oh my God, there are coming some really, really big noise peaks outside. So this is the maximum peak. So now I will put that in memory, open a new trace and put maximum hold as well. And off the other side corner, again, I will go on the corner and look what happened. Now you can see here is a big difference. Why? Because this side is metal, this side is metal, here are the screws closed, here are the screws closed. What could be inside in this box? Maybe I should show you the trick. Ta-da! Like you can see on this side is no gasket at all and here we use a conductive gasket WELT. This gasket makes that your shielding effectivity is much, much better and you will have no noise coming out of the box like you can see in the machinery and hope you enjoy it and please watch my next videos. Bye bye. This is another type of, or another option, I guess, for housing uh, in terms of a gasket. Uh, this is a fully metallic gasket. There's no fabric or foam as part of this. This is based on copper beryllium or stainless steel uh, spring contact strips. Uh, these are, as you can see, used usually in EMC test houses where you see the, the actual chambers, doors are lined up with this type of gasket. Uh, they maintain very good um, connectivity naturally between uh, the um, enclosure uh, sides. And in addition to this, of course, um, they are a lot more mechanically robust. We mentioned before with the fabric gasket that it was IP54 rated. We've also got, there's also uh, another type of gasket which is IP68 rated. So as a maximum type of protection from a waterproofing point of view. This is a rubber based material with a conductive filler. Um, and that gives you, uh, as well as, of course, um, um, a great connectivity across the uh, openings of the unit but also gives you a, a high degree of protection IP68. 
This slide just provides a comparison across the various different options when it comes to uh, gaskets available um, in terms of the protection, ingress protection, the compression force that is required, uh, the attachment method and operating temperature. I thought it acts as a nice summary of what your options are based on what your spec requirements might dictate. That covers the housing side of things. Let's look into cabling. We can naturally shield our cable using something like what you see here in terms of a, a braid. Uh, and we see this a lot um, in, in, uh, around uh, with people using this uh, internal or external to the unit. Uh, the problem is that uh, they terminate the shield with a very long pigtail which renders the shield totally ineffective. Um, and that's why we uh, um, suggest the use of a clip uh, that gives you a 360 termination and naturally you don't have to have six of them you can have one at either end where you're terminating your cable uh, at the connector or on the board or whatever uh, as long as that termination is as close as possible to the ground plane as you can with very little um, of the actual wires appearing um, or unshielded um, so that's uh, the main um, um, aspect when it comes to cable side of things. There's also another option that we will look at on the following slide. The other type of cable is of course a flat wire or ribbon type cable. And in this case, if we still want to use conductive type um, solution or shielding, I should say, so we can use a textile fabric adhesive tape um, uh, that we can stick on to the actual uh, ribbon cable. The thing with this, of course, it's pointless um, unless you have you ground the actual um, adhesive tape, the metallic, be it a copper or an aluminium tape, or the, the textile shielding tape. It needs to be somehow uh, bonded uh, to the ground plane. This might not be the most elegant type solution. It's not the most realistic type solution, let's say. Um, we will talk later on uh, about magnetic type uh, shielding material which might be more useful in the in the case of ribbon cables so we move on now to the final bit which is interfaces so things like an rs232 or a 485 d subtype connector uh, there's different options on this front you can use a filtered connector or alternatively there's the option of uh, using an adapter a d sub filter adapter with filtering built in within uh, either one so this way you can also avoid any uh, EMI on that particular type of interface coming out on your cables. I mentioned earlier as well the option or the possibility of using um, a shielded gasket which is stamped uh, for the shape uh, of the actual D-sub or whichever shape that you have um, in, in that case. Um, you also have a, a metal housing that you can use as well. Uh, for uh, the actual D-sub to stop any noise from escaping externally. Let's turn the attention now to board or PCB level type shielding from a solutions point of view. The first thing of course to identify is a copper ground plane within your PCB layers is a very useful uh, electric field shield. As usually what we use uh, when we're designing our layering of our PCB in terms of uh, including these ground planes in between uh, signal and power layers. Um, now the idea is of course um, your components sitting on top layer or bottom layer of your PCB can be either noisy or they can be sensitive components which in either case need to be shielded. If they're noisy, we need to stop that noise from coming out. If it's a sensitive RF circuit, we need to make sure that we protect that circuit from any external noise being radiated from the noisy part of our unit. And in either case, we will need to use something like a shielding cabinet as per the picture that you see in front of you. We need to create that low impedance connectivity down to that ground plane. So the shielding cabinet has got four sides naturally. Uh, the fifth side that we need to be worried or concerned about is within the PCB itself in the form of the actual ground plane. And that will complete the mini Faraday cage um, uh, encasing your sensitive or your noisy circuit. The board level shielding comes in a wide range or variety of different solutions. You can have a single piece solution which plugs straight into the PCB. Could be through hole or surface mount. It could be also a two piece solution, a frame and a cover. 
Uh, you could also have um, something which helps a little bit more uh, with the flexibility on the prototyping side of things with the surface mount clips where you can actually clip the, the cover or the housing in straight away on top of your sensitive circuit. These are naturally very easy to customize uh, parts. Not, it's, not, it's part and parcel of the nature of the requirement is to be able to customize this. One more thing to also mention, they could have an internal chamber as well within the actual shielding cabinet to shield certain parts from others within that uh, enclosure itself. So you could have a noisy part within the actual cabinet and a more sensitive part in the other side of the cabinet. And you can have all of that uh, in within one single shielding um, um, cabinet. The effectiveness of those shielding um, cabinets uh, varies uh, dependent on the architecture and the design of the actual shielding cabinet. The standard style, which is what I've shown you on the previous um, slides, uh, allows uh, for shielding up to a certain frequency. Usually we say three to five gigahertz. If you want to go for the latest type of high, much higher frequency um, um, applications, IoT, IOLink Wireless, GNSS, and 5G, uh, then there is a new type of uh, shielding cabinet which is called a seamless shielding cabinet. So as you can see from the picture, there are no seams on this um, uh, type of cabinet. It comes in two pieces, a frame uh, with a pick and place um, uh, design as well as a cover. Uh, and this is um, uh, designed in a different way and it's manufactured or produced in a different way using or um, um, as a, um, using something called the deep drone production process. Um, and this seamless design is better from a shielding effectiveness point of view because there are no seams as you can clearly see around um, either the frame or the base or the cover, I should say. This is a very useful piece of kit. It's a shield DIY kit that we do. Um, that's an A5 sheet of metal that uh, you are able to manipulate or design, where you can, you're able to manipulate or design your own shield. Uh, it's got a five millimeter grid on it, and it allows you to create a mini shield for your circuit, test it, design it for prototyping, and then uh, it can, it's possible to naturally uh, build a final product or customize a final product based on the, the dimensions and the requirements um, that you need. This can be used in conjunction with those uh, surface mount clips I mentioned before. So that covers the board level shielding from a shielding cabinet point of view. I'll hand you over to Laurent to show you the impact of those shielding cabinets on shielding uh, using this uh, uh, practical demo use that kind of different cabinets. I prepare here one of from the Shield D, which you can see in my previous videos. I did present this uh, homemade, you can do your own cabinets by yourself. And we will put this uh, Shield D on, on uh, antenna, which we will uh, source from a small generator. He make a kind of rectangle signal. It's a small quartz generator here, make oscillation and put the signal to this antenna. And in the same PCB, we can put and solder this cabinet, which I prepared before. It is right now soldered. Or when you make mass production, you have the possibility to use that kind of frame. You solder the frame by pick and place, SMD, and you have the cabinet to close it. And you can re-access for some tuning your, your device, or if you want to access again your electronic. But if you don't need to access electronic, you can save some money and you can use the uh, easiest version, which is just a, a cabinet, which can be soldered by pick and place and SMD, and then it's done and you have a completely shielding. So, first now we will switch on our noise generator, which I'm connected to the battery pack. And then we have a small uh, sniffer. This is a sniffer made from Universitat Valencia in collaboration with Root Electronic EMC Cathedra. And this one will have also power from the USB. And then we have a magnetic field, near field sensor. And if I go close to this antenna, you can see on the LED and you can hear it make magnetic field sniffering. Now I will take this uh, small uh, build own cabinet and we have some clips, special clips we, again, 
which can be placed on pick and place machine with SMD and I will try to fix that in the right way to have a good connection. That's it. And now again with the antenna. You can see it's not working and if I go to the septum exactly where the signal is coming out you can see here but no noise anymore here. So I hope you enjoy it and you will try to use by yourself and please watch my next videos. We will now leave um, conductive shielding as such to move into a different option uh, from a shielding point of view and this can be implemented at board level and at housing level. It's a very flexible solution. That's why we call it flexible absorber sheet. So this type of material is a base of rubber material with um, some type of metal powder, ferrite material, grains embedded within that. It gives it the flexibility to be introduced in various different locations within your enclosure in close proximity to noise sources uh, within on your PCB um, um, which allows it to which gives you that level of flexibility I guess to absorb or reflect that noise. We will see some of the characteristics of this type of uh, sheet material on the following slides but as per the pictures shown you can see that if you introduce this on the enclosure as the picture here shows so you're sticking that material and it is a self-adhesive on the backing of that sheet uh, in close proximity to where the noisy circuit is it will attenuate the radiated uh, electric magnetic field in particular of course but it does have a high permittivity so it will impact electric field as well So as a magnetic material or a magnetic based sheet material, uh, the flexible absorber sheet is characterized by two main characteristic uh, uh, parameters, mu dash and mu double dash, uh, which is the uh, uh, real permeability and the complex permeability. So, or as we call it, the uh, um, reflective, which is the mu dash and the absorb side of the material which is the mu double dash and this shows you the variety of different materials that are available and how they vary in terms of their effectiveness naturally the higher the permeability the higher the level of either reflection or absorption both are useful both are good effects uh, that can help us with our shielding this is another option for using the flexible absorber sheet. As you can see in the picture, this can be directly introduced on actual noisy bus lines or tracks on a PCB. Uh, and that being the case, it will provide a certain level of attenuation of that signal as shown on the graphs here. Now what we've tried to do with this uh, setup is compare different types of materials which have different permeabilities with the same thickness. As you will see on the following slide, thickness also makes a difference. We did mention this to you earlier on today. We said the thicker the material, the higher the shielding capability as well as permeability as well. So materials vary in their permeability and they vary in their thickness. The highest permeability and the highest thickness would be the most effective type material, but they also vary in frequency as well. So that's also something to watch out for. Um, so just to show you also the test setup, by the way, this test setup, these measurements, uh, the attenuation that you see versus frequency are all available for all of our sheet material on Red Expert, our flagship component selection tools. You'll be able to even um, down select based on a specific frequency or frequency range, the most suitable type of sheet material. I have included a link at the end of this presentation to the module in Red Expert that looks at um, the shielding material or sheet material. So on here again we look at various different types of materials with, uh, sorry I beg your pardon, it's the same type of material with various different thicknesses. So we start in off here with 32401 which is a 0.1 millimeter and we're going all the way to 10 
which is one millimeter basically. Uh, they're all the same material, so permeability here is not making any difference. The difference is in the thickness. Um, and as you can see, um, thicker material is more effective in where? The lower frequency ranges. As you go up into the 7, 8 gigahertz, uh, the tables turn, and it is the thinner materials that become more effective. So that's also something that might be um, uh, um, useful, and you will see this again in the information provided in Red Expert, as I mentioned earlier. On the next slide, we will have uh, another demonstration by Laurent showing us the impact of, various, of different uh, thicknesses on the effectiveness of the shielding uh, material, the shielding sheets. In this video, I want to show you the effectivity of shielding absorbing material. We have here a small EMC scanner, it's kind of uh, own build um, scanner with a, a near field probe in magnetic field. It was uh, made in collaboration with Universidad de Valencia, Catedra Blue Electronic EMC. And we have here a small uh, noise generator. Uh, behind this box is a small quartz oscillator which make a rectangle signal on a small loop antenna. And then we have a defined distance for the magnetic field fixed and when we switch on this device you will hear some noise and we have some LEDs which show you about the field intensity. Now I will switch on the battery pack. Maximum field and I will test different uh, VAFIS. It will be one of those will be uh, 0.05 millimeter and if I put to this field you will see and you hear already it's sticking less. I have two LEDs less field uh, because it's, it's absorbing the, the magnetic field and if I go to the next uh, higher thickness uh, 0.3 millimeter and I put between the near field probe you see already it's less field and if I go to the 0.5, which is the most thicker one, we have green light. It means it's absorbing almost everything. You still have some magnetic field because you just uh, put on it and it works. So as soon you increase the intensity or the thickness of this uh, shielding material, you will have much better effectivity of shielding and you absorb much more magnetic field. Hope you enjoy it. Um, another useful aspect to consider for, from a, um, a ferrite sheet, a flexible sheet point of view, is uh, of course the ability to reflect the magnetic field. So that ability to do this can be also quite a useful function in applications like NFC, RFID or wireless power transfer. So in this situation, we are not actually absorbing the magnetic field, we're just facilitating, redirecting, reflecting that magnetic field. The curves shown here um, indicate um, the behavior of two different types of materials. One that is optimized for uh, reflecting low frequency magnetic fields which are used predominantly in wireless power transfer and the other type of material is more geared for NFC RFID type uh, frequencies and the main difference that you can see is not in the mu dash side of things which is the reflection permeability but it's also in the absorption permeability that needs to be fairly low um, and that's where you see at 13.56 megahertz, the absorption side of the material is very small. And the same thing for uh, the 150 kilohertz, the absorption side is relatively small for those types of materials. So that's uh, that uh, component or that sheet is called the WFSFS flexible sintered ferrite sheet. Just as an example of an RFID system, um, if you have some metallic surface, um, a casing or a battery in the close vicinity to the comms coils, then they will detune your resonance as per the picture that you can see. And this will result in a shift in the tag and the reader frequency, beg your pardon, and 
you will not be able to read you will not be able to read your tag basically and by introducing that flexible fit ferrite sheet as we've shown earlier you are allowing or making sure that that magnetic field is actually coupled straight back as opposed to being dissipated as we can see on the left hand side in terms of eddy currents uh, which are responsible for this detuning and the frequency shift that we see if there is a metallic surface in close vicinity to that system. On the following uh, slide, we'll have a presentation given by uh, our product manager who looks after the shielding um, product range uh, to show us that impact uh, in practice. To simulate the metallic surface, here we have a metallic card. This one is made of the same material as the shielding cabinets. We place it on one of the slots under the RFID antenna. And here we can see a normal system of RFID. First, if we take it out and we use a normal RFID antenna, if we measure the distance of communication, we have five millimeters can see the distance here, and again, 6 millimeters, 11 millimeters. Now we placed, we can place the metallic surface, one of the slots, and we can see we have no communication at, at the previous distance. We have to go closer, closer, closer. And you can see at zero millimeters we have communication. So the communication is much worse. Sometimes even we don't have any communication. To solve this, we have a FSFS material 3641. This is the newest, released in at the end of 2018. It's flexible as the other FSF material. And it also has uh, adhesive tape for an easy application. If we place the material in the slot between the metallic surface and the antenna, now we can see 10 millimeters, try it again, 16 millimeters, 10 millimeters, one more time, 12 millimeter, millimeters. Basically, what the material is doing is reflecting the magnetic field. So it's protecting the system from the metallic surface and at the same time is able to, to create an improvement on the, on the communication distance because the material is able to reflect this field. When it's reflecting the field upwards, then the, the distance and the, the strength of the, of the field is, is higher at bigger distance, at higher distances. And the exact same concept would apply for the wireless power transfer side of things. What you can see here are a comparison between two systems. Uh, on the left hand side, we have got a transmitter and a receiver with uh, no backing in terms of a flexible uh, sintered ferrite sheet. What you can see is the magnetic field um, uh, escapes or, or is spread uh, much wider around the two coils in other words the coupling between the two coils is limited while when you introduce a flexible scented ferrite sheet on both sides you end up with a much better tighter coupling most of the magnetic flux lines are concentrated in that air gap in between the transmitter and the receiver resulting in much better power uh, wireless power transfer uh, from a coupling and efficiency point of view We'll, uh, we'll shift the attention now to a different type of flexible absorber sheet. Uh, this is one that gives you two in one in a way. It gives you absorption and reflection of magnetic field in the same way that a flexible absorber sheet does. But it's also very good from a heat conduction point of view. It's got ceramic particles embedded within the polymer base, which also has, of course, magnetic metal powder as well. Uh, so to give us uh, two functions in one, good thermal conductivity, so it acts as a, as a very nice interface between a noisy IC, a CPU for example, and a heatsink, preventing that heatsink from 
acting as an antenna as we started off talking about today. Another useful option to have is using a thermal gap filler type material. Now this material has got no RF shielding properties. There's no magnets in there. There's no conductivity, electrical conductivity there. But what there is, is there's very good thermal conductivity. So this component can uh, be introduced, as you can see, as part of um, a gap filler filling the gap in between your noise source, your noisy IC, and your cabinet and your heat sink in order to give a good thermal conductivity to that. So this could be basically used to line the inside of your shielding cabinet to create a good thermal pathway from the top of your IC into the actual um, um, shielding cabinet itself as a heat sink. Um, um, so that uh, helps you bridge that and re reduce your thermal resistance. We will finish off by shifting back to our board level shielding slash grounding and looking at one very useful solution in the form of contact fingers or contact springs. Uh, these are metal uh, made out of metal, copper, beryllium or phosphor bronze. They're gold coated um, and these basically provide you with the ability to make contact between various boards from a grounding point of view as you can see here this is soldered onto the PCB and the other part of it sits and makes contact with a pad or with um, uh, a ground layer plane on a PCB that's sitting on top of this. So this allows you to maintain grounding across various different boards. Uh, this comes in a wide range of different uh, sizes and shapes to suit the requirements naturally of your enclosure and your PCB. So you don't have to have vertical, it could be horizontal connectivity as well as uh, the options are um, uh, wide. So the contact springs we showed earlier, they do eventually of course lose their elasticity after excessive compression in particular of course. So there is also another option. We have got a system which has got compression security. So it will compress only to a certain level to uh, um, save the component, I guess, or to stop the component from uh, being damaged or from excessive or over compression. Finally, it's not necessary that we use these uh, contact springs to just uh, make contact between grounds. They can be used between two RF circuits or as a connection uh, with RF antenna modules. So you can connect signal as well as connecting ground should you wish to do so. Um, an alternative solution to the contact springs is to use this type of cellular block. It's basically foam material, polyurethane, uh, similar to what was used in um, the shielding gaskets. Uh, but instead of having fabric with nickel, copper, aluminium, what we have here is tin plated exterior, which allows you to basically solder it onto a PCB. Now the advantage of something like this is you can compress it because it's full material on the inside and it does give you good resistance um, versus compression uh, as per the profile shown. So this is also another option. This can be a pick and place also a machine um, uh, placed on a PCB. The final option is um, of course to use grounding strips or earthing clip uh, strips. Uh, these are basically a braid or wire mesh with heat shrink tubing on the outside. We mentioned at the very outset of today that it's not a good idea to have long pigtails and connectivity between the uh, external shields to a cable harness down to ground needs to be 360 degrees terminated with a clip but in some occasions that is not possible and sometimes you are not able to use the contact springs or the uh, foam material i've just mentioned earlier so you may be able to use something like uh, a little braid or a wire mesh or these grounding strips to make ground contacts between pcbs and the main enclosure of different pcbs the point is always to minimize uh, the length of these, maximize the thickness as much as you can. 
I have included a few what I see as useful web links. Oh, just to remind you that I still am here. Um, so that's a, a finishing off picture of myself. And here are some uh, what I think might be useful, hopefully, application notes uh, on the topic. And I've also included a link here to our Red Expert tool, which again shows you information regarding the selection of the flexible absorber sheet, RFID, or wireless power transfer. And it has got, uh, as you can see, the um, attenuation curves here. You've got a cursor where you can set your uh, attenuation frequency that you want, attenuation level that you want, and then you can filter on the useful uh, sheet material uh, for your application requirements. Thank you for your attention. Um, I hope you found this useful and I look forward to seeing you in future webinars, maybe seminars, face to face for a change. Um, please do come and visit us in our virtual stand. And if you have any questions, please fire away.